everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Kathy Piercy and I am the Community Education Coordinator for Ontario for Osteoporosis Canada and I'm very pleased to be your presenter today. So as we launch into the second half of the Speaking of Bones, I just wanted to mention that Speaking of Bones is our national speakers program of Osteoporosis Canada. It is usually delivered by our trained volunteer speakers in many communities across Canada. But today we will be presenting this presentation virtually because of the times we are living in. If you would like to submit a question, on the side panel on the right-hand side of your screen, you will see a box that says questions. Type your question into that text box and we will receive your question and try and answer it at the end of the presentation. Heather will be joining me at the end of the presentation to help with the questions. Okay, so let's move right into the second half of our Speaking of Bones. I can get my slides to move. Oops. There they go. Okay, so I just wanted to mention that Osteoporosis Canada we're here to empower and educate and support those living um, individually in communities with at risk of um, osteoporosis and osteoporotic fractures. We do have a, on the Scientific Advisory Council, and this is a group of medical experts that um, vet all of our information, any of the pamphlets, anything that you see um, in this presentation on on our website so that you know it's all scientifically um, updated and correct. So you know that you're getting uh, great information. So last week, we talked about bone basics, the fracture risk assessment and nutrition. And today I want to do the second half of the presentation. So we're going to be going over exercise and movement, medication options and falls and broken bones. But before we move forward, I would like to say um, I am not a healthcare professional, I am an educator, and so this is going to kind of be an overview of um, some exercise movements, some medications, but I think it will give you a really good idea of, of what we can be doing when we're living with osteoporosis, osteoporosis and, and what options are available to you. So let's get right into exercise. Um, so some of you may have been on the webinar last week with Dr. Laura, um, and she did a fabulous presentation. So I'm just going to do kind of a recap, and then um, you can kind of look forward to watching her presentation as well. So when you're living with osteoporosis and you're looking at exercise and movement, there's some things that you really need to be aware of. What is your risk of fracturing? So when we talked about the risk assessment, are you at low or moderate risk of having a fracture? Then you can probably do most activities safely, the things that you've been used to doing. Um, if you're at moderate, you may want to, you know, avoid um, high impact sports, um, for instance, um, or high, Sports that are high risk of falling. So let's say downhill skiing, uh, for instance, you might have a higher risk of falling or skating. But again, if you're at moderate risk or low risk, and this is something that you have done for your whole life, like you started skiing and or skating as a child, then probably more safely you can continue to do that. But you might want to look at modifying that and maybe not going out on weekends when it's so busy, kind of go in between um during the week maybe um don't do you know the hills that are um you know you're not going to be doing the black diamonds anymore you may be doing the, the smaller hills but at least you're still out and about and then you move to high risk and now if you are high risk you might want to look at um somebody to help start to modify some of the activities that that you're used to doing you may want to look for somebody who's bone fit trained, and you can find bone fit trained ed, um, instructors on our website. You may wanna talk to a physical or an occupational therapist as well um, to help kind of look at the activities that you're doing and how can you modify them to become more safe for you. 
Um, and so again, when you're at high risk of fracture and you want somebody to help you look at the activities that involve um, lifting or rapid, repetitive, weighted end, bending, twisting. So think about a golf swing. Um, you know, it's, it, it's weighted, the weight is at the far end, you're, you're twisting, it's repetitive. If you golf like me, you, 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 there's, a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of hits in a game. Um, so how can you modify that? Well, again, you can look at a, uh, at a physical uh, therapist to help you with that, or just modifying your game slightly that maybe you're not playing 18 holes three times a week, maybe you're playing nine holes once or twice a week so that you're still doing the activity that you love you're just not doing it as often so those are some ways that you can modify some of your um, movements or activities that you love to do so when we look at osteoporosis um, weight bearing exercise is not enough we used to tell everybody go for a walk and that will be great but we're learning more and dr laura from the presentation last week is doing a lot of research on the importance of strength training to uh, get your strength and balance and looking at your posture. So when we look at strength training, and, and two, now that we're at home, so some of us may have been going to the gym using equipment, that sort of thing. So now we need to kind of look around our house and what can be, we be using. Um, she had mentioned, you know, a, a bag of rice, um, you know, maybe some water jugs or those large vinegar jugs and or soup cans or um, so, something heavier to give you a little bit of resistance are great ways um, to add resistance into your routine at home. But you want to be doing um, exercising your major muscle groups at least two to three times a week. And so that's lower legs, uh, chest, back, shoulders and arms. So some easy things we can, getting up and down off a chair actually is a squat. So are we able to do that comfortably without using those arms to push ourselves up? Um, so thinking about getting up and down off a chair and how many times can you do that? Um, when we look at chest, back, shoulders and arms, we could be doing a push up on the wall, for instance. Um, that gives you some great resistance, just making sure that you're on a on a floor that you're not going to slip and just doing a nice push up along the wall is a great um, great exercise for strength training so moving on to posture and usually when i do this presentation in front of people everybody starts to wiggle around and sit a little bit more upright um, than they were when they first started so when we look at posture we're really thinking about that core and bringing that core in. Um, so a little exercise that you could do to, to kind of check your posture to see what that looks like. Um, if you kind of move your shoulders back and forth, kind of like wings, and wherever they fall, that's a nice um, comfortable position for you um, for where your shoulders should be. Then I want you to think that you're um, gently pulling in your belly, bringing kind of bringing that belly button towards your spine, looking straight ahead, gently tucking that chin down, and then pretend that you have um, a pretty necklace on or a bow tie, and just lift that chest up slightly. And you may feel that you are sitting a little bit taller, um, or if you're standing in this position, you can find yourself a little bit taller. So if you can stay in this position for at least 30 seconds, especially if you're still sitting down, to sit in a really nice posture could be a bit of an exercise because some of us just start to slump down. So if I say to you, relax, just notice what your body has done. Has, have you kind of collapsed forward? Did your shoulders come forward? So think about um, throughout your day, practicing good posture. And in order to have good posture, one of the ideas that Dr. Laura had mentioned last week, and you can do this with me right now, is we want to practice those back muscles or, or work on those back muscles um, because sometimes they get forgotten. So if you, 
interesting to describe this. So I want you to have your hands up in the air. Your palms are facing um, the wall in front of you. And kind of make a W so that your, your arms are, are bent at the elbow and they kind of make a W. Now, if you kind of push those arms back, you should feel your shoulder blades drawing together. That's a wonderful little exercise or movement um, for those shoulder blades to, to keep moving. And those are the, that muscle group that you really want to work on so that you're not getting that really rounded posture that we, we're not, none of us are wanting. So then moving on to balance training. You can easily uh, make balance exercises a part of your life. Um, simple ways to do that, you can do heel raises while you're um, waiting for your tea or your kettle to boil. Just standing along the, the countertop and then just rising up on your toes and, and going down. You can walk uh, heel to toe every time you go to the bathroom. Um, tai Chi is a great exercise. Uh, dancing, movement, um, just even maybe starting a smaller sequence that you start with your feet together. And you may have something uh, close to you that you can hold on to. If you start with your feet together, you may find yourself swaying a little bit. So this is where you've narrowed your base of support and you may need to um, practice there a little bit. And then you slide your foot, one foot forward so that your heel and your big toe are together. You might find yourself a little more challenged this way, having one foot in front of the other. That again, all of a sudden you've narrowed your base of support. And this could be a real challenge for you. So this is where that you would start your practice. And then try it with the other foot because one side of us is usually stronger than the other. So you may find that you have better balance on one side than you do on the other. Uh, standing on one foot is always um, a, a challenge. But again, when you're doing this, uh, making sure that you have something uh, sturdy beside you, a table, a counter, uh, a chair that's not going to slide across the floor or have wheels on it or something like that. So we want to challenge our balance every single day because we want to reduce our risk of falling. And the better our balance is, the less um, chance of falling we have. So then we move on to weight bearing. So how weight bearing is beneficial uh, is, is that gravity, right? So that things like walking or dancing or aerobics are good examples of this. And we want to do at least 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise most days of the week. So you want to be kind of getting that heart rate up so that you know, you can um, still talk, but it's a little bit challenging. This is a really nice time. I know this is a hard time for people to get out and about, but we are getting to um, hopefully nicer weather. Uh, and, you know, getting out for a walk, being aware of our social distancing. Um, but you know what? Dancing is a beautiful thing. You can do that in your home, in your living room. Just put some music on and, and move. Just move. It's going to do a couple of things. It's going to lift your spirit because um, dancing and music is just such a wonderful uh, combination. But dancing is wonderful because you can move your body differently in space. So you can move to the side, you can move backwards, and you're challenging your balance that way as well. Uh, just make sure that your room is nice and clear <laughs> so that you're not tripping over anything. But there are some precautions um, that we want you to think about. And I had mentioned some of these. So we want to avoid movements that involve rapid, repetitive, weighted or end range bending or twisting of the spine, especially if you are at high risk. Um, so as I mentioned, golf kind of <laughs> is that repetitive weighted at the end. There are some yoga moves that involve twisting of the spine that we want to be very, very mindful of or um, modify. And again, that's when you would talk to a physical therapist or an occupational therapist on how you can move or 
change or modify that movement. So instead of doing twisting, we want to step to turn instead of twisting the body. So I'm going to try and explain this. Um, so let's say you're at your kitchen counter and you're, you're baking, let's say, and you twist over because you need to get the eggs out of the fridge. So instead of just twisting your whole body, I want you to move your feet. So think about wherever your toes are pointed, your hips should be pointed. And that should keep your spine in a more neutral position. So again, wherever your toes are pointed is the same direction your hips should be pointed. So think about daily activities. Um, you know, we may be doing some raking or sweeping the floor, uh, vacuuming. What it's going to do is just give you more steps throughout the day. So kind of be mindful when you're sweeping the floor that, again, where your toes are pointed, your hips should be pointed. You want to avoid lifting and lowering right from the floor. So, you know, bending right over to the floor could put a lot of pressure on your spine. So you may want to look at, you know, getting one of those reacher grabbers that maybe, you know, maybe it's a Kleenex that has fallen or a tea towel that you can reach um, instead of reaching right to the, to the ground. You may want to think about, uh, you know, when it's laundry, instead of putting the laundry basket right onto the floor, or um, you may want to have a, a, a bench there or a little chair that you put it on. We hopefully will get to start doing some gardening so again, when you're thinking about gardening, maybe your beds are raised, but not putting the plants right onto the ground. Maybe you have a stool that you put them onto. Um, slow control twist and not to the end uh, range of motion. So again, you want to be very um, controlled when you're doing your movements. You don't want to be robot-like, but you want to be very mindful that you're not twisting uh, that spine to the full um, to the full range. And hold weight close to your body, not overhead. So Dr. Laura did talk about um, that there's uh, not putting weights over your head. But again, when we're looking at everyday activities, um, like laundry baskets, hold those close into, into your body when you're moving those around. Uh, groceries, again, close into your body. Um, going into gardening season and maybe you're transplanting different, uh, and I've, I've got different uh, plants moving, uh, popping up now, and I, I want to do some transplanting. So putting them in, in a pot, but again, holding them close to my body so that I'm not putting that strain on my spine. So I've mentioned, um, Dr. Laura Jean Gregorio many times over this past section. So this is actually on our website. It is an excellent uh, presentation to watch if you're looking for more in-depth things that you can be doing at home. She did some little uh, videos so you could actually see what she's doing. So this would be very, very worth your time to go onto our website and, um, and look at that. And it would be under the Osteoporosis Canada replay section on the home page. So let's move on to the medication options. And again, um, I would just like to mention that I am an educator. So this next section is going to be an overview of what the medications can do for you. Um, but any specific medication questions, I would suggest that you talk to your pharmacist or your healthcare professional to really understand how that medication is working best for you. So some points to remember when we're looking at osteoporosis medication, that there are medications available for treatment and they do uh, reduce the risk of osteoporotic fractures. Uh, people respond differently to medications. Every person's situation is gonna be unique to them. All medications reduce the risk of a table fracture by 30 to 70%. And individuals that are high risk, the benefits of drug therapy far outweigh the potential risk. So you have to do a bit of a, a risk analysis for yourself. But please don't forget that even if you are on medication, 
attention to diet, one that is rich in calcium and vitamin D, and exercise is still very, very important. So the next few slides, I'm going to go over what medications are available here in Canada, tell you a little bit about them and how they might be working in your body. Um, so hopefully that will give you a better understanding of what, what's there. So these types of medications, they're under an umbrella called bisphosphonate. And what they do in your body is they, they work by slowing down bone erosion. Uh, there are three first-line bisphosphonates available for the treatment of osteoporosis in menopausal women, and in some cases men, and glucocoid-induced osteoporosis. So the first one is Fosamax. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about the, the medications in brackets. Uh, that's how most of us um, understand the medication. Alendronate is kind of the, uh, the way the doctors would talk, but most patients understand or, or refer to the medication name in brackets. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is Fosamax, and it was approved in 1996. It is taken daily, or once weekly with a full glass of water before eating. A number of generic versions of Fosamax are available as well as Fosavance, a version of Fosamax um, combined. And these sometimes are combined um, with vitamin D as well. And they're also taken weekly. The next one I wanna talk about is uh, Actinel. So Actinel was approved for osteoporosis in the year 2000. It too is taken daily, weekly, or monthly with a half a glass of water first thing in the morning, at least a half an hour before eating or drinking. Weekly dosages are available as a generic as well. And Actinel also has um, a medication called Actinel DR, and the DR means delayed release, and it's taken with breakfast. So if you have an, the side effect of kind of that acid reflex feeling that sometimes these, this is a side effect from these medications. Maybe the, the um, Actinel DR may be a better option for you because you can eat that with food. And then Eclasta was approved in 2007 to treat osteoporosis. And it is administered once a year as a 15 minute intravenous infusion by a certified healthcare professional. I want to mention, um, if you're taking Fosamax or Actinel, and many people that I've talked to are do, taking it weekly or monthly, and sometimes it's hard to remember. And if you're not taking your medication, it's not working for you. So I've had different people that have given me suggestions, especially if you're on the weekly um, medication. They take it, they set it up so it's the same day as their garbage day. So they remember garbage day is once a week. Oh yes, I need to take my osteoporosis medication. Some people have mentioned that they take it every Sunday because Sunday, uh, us usually <laughs> when we're not living in the times we're living, Sunday is usually a little bit of a different day of the week. Um, and so that's a, a way to remember to take your daily, uh, or sorry, your weekly medication. Just a fun little tip there. So let's talk a little bit about Prolia. Um, so Prolia was approved in 2010 for postmenopausal men, or so postmenopausal post women and men with, uh, with osteoporosis that are at high risk of fracturing. Um, so it's an injection as well um, under, the, under the skin every six months, and you would need to go to your healthcare professional um, to have that injection done. The other two are not used quite as often. So the um, hormone therapy um, is usually for more women when they're seeking relief of menopausal symptoms. And then the Avista um, is sometimes referred to as a designer estrogen. They act like estrogen in some parts of the body, while in other parts, they block the effects of estrogen. That is why they are said to be receptive and selective. This is a first-line treatment only for vertebral fractures. 
So it's not kind of looking at all of the fractures that you can have. So that's why that one's not always one of the first lines. But what, um, so these are the medications, like I said, that are slowing down. They work in the body by slowing down that bone erosion um, or that osteoclast. Then we look at two areas of medication that actually build bones. And this is an anabolic. Um, and most patients would know this as Forteo, and it is a daily injection under the skin for no more than 24 months. So a little bit of information about Forteo. So this acts on the bone remodeling process so that new bone is generated and added to the skeleton faster than old bone is broken down. It does this by activating the osteoblast or the building bone building cells. Forteo was approved in 2004 to treat osteoporosis in menopausal women and men with severe osteoporosis who are at high risk of further fracture. It is also approved for glucocoid-induced osteoporosis. It is, as I mentioned, it is taken as a daily injection in the thigh or abdomen wall for no longer than 24 months, after which time the individual goes on anti-resorptive therapy. So your daily injections is something that you would do yourself as a patient, okay? And then the newest medication um, that has come onto the market to increase bone formation and decrease bone resorption is, I'm gonna, again, the name of the bracket that we'll know it by, the patients will know it by, is Avinity. And it's two injections uh, once a month for a year. So this medication was improved just this year in 2020 for postmenopausal women at high risk of fracture. It is administered as two injections under the skin, one right after another by a trained healthcare professional. We do this once a month for a year. So in total, there's 12 doses, if required, and then an anti-resorptive agent may be considered after completion of an avinity. Okay. So those are kind of, that's just an overview of what medications are available in Canada at this time. So how do we know if our medication is working? For most of you um, that are, if you are on a medication, you probably won't feel any different if you're taking the medication um, properly. It, most people don't even notice a difference. Um, that being said, every single medication that you put into your body does have a side effect. So there may be, there may be a, a side effect, as I mentioned, acid reflux, but that's something that you can talk to your, your doctor or your um, pharmacist about and maybe see if there's um, a different one. As I mentioned, the actin LDR, that may help that. But for overall kind of the general population, you will not feel any different. Um, how do you know if it's working? Yes, if, a bo if your bone density remains the same or increases slightly, or you have no new fractures that occur. That means the medication is working. We kind of live in a society that we think, well, if we're taking medication, it's gonna make us better. At this point, there's actually no cure for osteoporosis. So the medication is there to keep your bone density kind of where it is and not let it drop any further. Or you may actually notice that it will increase just slightly. But if you're 80 years old taking medication, you're probably not going to get to the bone strength that you had when you were 30. Uh, we monitor this through a bone mineral density test. And so sometimes people will say, you know, well, I've been on my medication for, you know, three, four months. I want to have a, another uh, BMD done to see if my medication's working. The medication needs to be in your body for about a year. Uh, before you can actually see if there's any difference on your uh, BMD results. So um, that's something to be mindful of as well. Um, and then lastly, if you discontinue the medication, bone loss may result. So just to be uh, aware of that, 
as well, if you discontinue your, your medication, please, please, please let your healthcare provider know that you've done that um, and don't just go off without their knowledge. Moving on now to falls and broken bones. As we get older, we are more likely to fall. For people over 65, 30% fall each year, and that number is even higher for people over the age of 80. Well, and we think, well, so what if we fall? We just dust ourselves off and, and get right back up. Well, that's not always what happens. Falls are a significant cause of death and disability and have a serious impact on psychological and physical health in the elderly. These injuries could include a hip fracture, head and brain injuries, a sprained or broken wrist or ankles. Injuries from falls are one of the leading causes of admittance into nursing homes. Therefore, not only are they they're a cost a financial cost of hospitalization, but it's also a loss of independence. And as we age, I think everybody's main goal is to stay independent as long as possible. So one consequence of a fall is a fracture. It's important that osteoporosis, fracture prevention, and falls are recognized as a trio of interrelated health issues. Any intervention targeting one of these three issues should acknowledge the other two. In this slide, we're looking at the fall cycle. So if you have a history of previous falls, um, one of the best predictors, that is one of the best predictors of a future fall, if you're prone to falling. Uh, a previous fall increases the risk of another fall by threefold, so that is huge. A previous fall may reduce mobility in an older person, resulting in loss of strength, balance, and reflexes. Feelings of fear and helplessness may also ensue, further adding to restrictions on activity and participation and reduced quality of life. So being cautious and aware of risky situations actually can be healthy, being very mindful about the environment you're in. Problems arise when this normal caution becomes a fear of falling. This fear causes many seniors to limit their activities, resulting in less physical activity and reduced strength and flexibility. And this in turn can increase the risk of falling. So when we look at this circle, um, I hope none of you are kind of in this circle. Um, maybe you have fallen and then you're worried about um, falling again, so you decrease your activity. Um, as I mentioned, then your muscle and strength is, is not as much, um, and then you actually increase your risk of falling. So somewhere this, this cycle has to be broken. So if you're living kind of in this cycle, or if you know somebody who is, you know, somewhere it needs to be broken. So it could be, um, yes, you have a fear of falling, but you need to keep moving um, and doing some of the exercises that we talked about. Um, you know, just maybe a little bit of balance training every day just to kind of get your um, confidence back again. All right, and then to summarize, um, there are different types of people you can go to, to for the help to help with falls prevention. Um, you should talk to your doctor about any medical problems that you're having, especially if you get dizzy. Um, that that could be you know something with your medication or something. But if you're if you're dizzy a lot, it's something that we need to be looking at. You need to have your blood pressure checked, that sort of thing. A physical therapist can help improve your walking and balance. So participating in um, regular exercise program. I know it's harder now that we can't get out and about, um, but you know, doing something every day and moving your body in a, in a healthy way as we're at home. An occupational therapist can help you improve your home safety and help you find the best devices that assist you. So looking around your home, picking up that clutter uh, so that you're not tripping over things, um, pets, pets are a wonderful, wonderful um, 
company and, and friendship. But if you have a little little pet or a little dog, they like to be near you. And so just be very mindful if they're scurrying around your feet um, and things like that. You want to be very aware of that. Um, looking at some of these other ones, number one, having your vision and your hearing checked, especially if you get a new prescription. Sometimes, um, you know, if you move from a, a bifocal to a trifocal, it takes some getting used to uh, where you're supposed to be looking. So uh, being mindful of that. Uh, having your hearing checked, uh, just, and, and we don't always think about hearing and, and falling, but um, our equilibrium is in our ears. So we want to be very um, aware that, that our, our ears are in good health. We talked about having our medications reviewed. Know why you're taking a medication. What is it for? What is it doing in your body? Having your blood pressure checked. Um, you know, or do you have very low blood pressure and you get dizzy? Uh, taking better care of your feet and reviewing your footwear. So being mindful um, that your toenails are trimmed up properly. If you've ever had that toenail that kind of digs into the side of your, your toe, it changes it, and it hurts, it, but it can change the way you walk. Um, and so that could affect, uh, become a tripping hazard. Um, looking at your footwear, um, what are you wearing on your feet? Are they just, you know, we're, we're coming into a season where, you know, we like shoes that slip on easily, could be flip flops or some fun, um, little shoes, but do they have the best um, tread on them, especially when you're going from different floor surfaces, if it's a, um, a smooth surface to grass to pavement, um, you know, does it give you enough, does it give your foot enough support to, to hold you up? We talked um, about regular exercise and adding those balance exercises. We've talked last week about eating healthy, uh, staying eating a well-balanced diet, staying hydrated, making sure that you're getting enough fluid into your body because um, many times, um, you know, falls could happen because of dehydration. Looking at the calcium that you take into your body and your vitamin D. We talked a little bit about home hazards, picking things up, don't let things, you know, uh, get cluttered in your home. Um, how many pairs of shoes do you have sitting at the front door? Are they, you know, just kind of thrown there? Or are they in a nice area so that you're not tripping over them? Um, again, pets. I mentioned pets. And then learn more about equipment for your home. Um, so this is where an occupational therapist might be able to help you. Um, if you've been, um, if it's been suggested to you to use a cane or a walker, just want you to think about it a little bit differently that instead of thinking oh my goodness this cane and walker is going to make me look old think about it as this cane or walker is actually going to keep me independent longer and again I as I mentioned earlier I think that is everybody's goal as as we age that we want to be independent for as long as possible so these um, tools um, can help us with that So again, where to find more information, uh, please go to our website, www.osteoprosis.ca. Uh, we've been working very hard um, over the last six weeks of getting new information to you in, in different ways um, through webinars, and trust me, there's more coming. Um, please sign up for COPEN in, in our, on our website. Uh, so COPEN is a Canadian Osteoproduct Patient Network or now called Unbreakable. Um, you would get great information to your email once a month. Uh, find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, we now have a YouTube channel as well. And I know for some of us, this may have been foreign. If we did this presentation you know, two months ago, we may have said, no, 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 I, I, I'm not on any of that crazy stuff. But the world we're living in right now, um, we're needing to um, turn to technology for um, for some learning. So please, um, you know, c consider um, trying something new and, uh, you know, j um, finding us on Facebook. So there's different ways too that you can connect with us. And I hope there's people joining us from right across the country. So if you're in BCM, Alberta, Liz would love to talk to you. Um, Sandy is in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. So she's the um, community engagement, we're all the community engagement coordinators, so uh, providing education, just like what I've done the last couple of weeks. 
um, just an overview. Uh, I'm in Ontario. And then we have Heather Eatson, our, our manager, is looking after Quebec and the East Coast. So as I mentioned, uh, lots of information that I've talked about over the last two Mondays. Uh, it's a, a nice overview. I hope you've learned something new today. Uh, but we do have our 1-800 number, and we do, as I mentioned, have lots of um, new information coming uh, on, on our website. So thank you for joining us today, Heather. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Kathy. Um, there have been a couple questions um, come out. Um, I'm gonna, uh, a couple of them are related to the exercise component. Um, Kathy, one of them is, is jogging safe for someone who has osteoporosis? Great question. So when we look at exercise, it has to be very individualized. We can't do a blanket. Everybody should be jogging. For me, I don't care for jogging. So, um, but, so we have to look at it. Is jogging something that you've been doing for years? Uh, it, and if it is, it's probably very, very safe for you to continue jogging. If you're 70 years old and have just been diagnosed with osteoporosis and you think, oh, I'm gonna take up jogging, there, that might not be the best time to take up that new activity. So again, looking at the activities that you love, if it's something that you've always done, it's probably safe to continue. Um, if it's something that you want to add new into your routine, I would suggest finding um, a physiotherapist, somebody who has some knowledge about osteoporosis, maybe who's bone fit trained, to be able to see if that's something that would be safe for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's another question about exercise, a little bit more specific. Um, hello, does tucking in your belly for good posture also help in tightening, um, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, it, for good posture also help in tightening the abdomen muscles? Should people with osteoporosis be doing abs work and which kind is safe? Ab work, okay. So this I'm going to mention again, Please, please, please watch Dr. Laura's uh, presentation because she talked a lot about core work and about bringing in that belly button or feeling like you've got um, a belt belt on. Um, because yes, you want to tighten or work on your core to keep your back muscles strong. When we think of ab abdominal exercises, there's <laughs> Yeah, that one, it, it's tricky to do over a presentation. It's easier to, to see visually, and she had some suggestions. So doing some abdominal exercises where you're lying on the floor so that your, your back, your spine is supported, and maybe um, bending those knees, lifting one knee up towards your chest, bringing it down, bringing the other up. So working those abdominal muscles, but keeping that spine very, very safe. And she has some suggestions and some visuals um, that will help you with that because it's hard to do visuals um, on a, in a setting like this. But yes, it's safe for somebody with osteoporosis to be doing abdominal muscle or abdominal exercises. You just want to be very mindful that your spine is really supported like being on the floor or on your bed. Thank you. And Kathy, I wondered if you wanted to remind people about the handouts that are available and how they can access those. Yes, no, that's wonderful. So this week we have two handouts. So one was on the drug treatment. Um, like I said, it will give you maybe a little bit more information on the different uh, medication options that are available in Canada and how to use them. And it may be a really good starting point to have to start a conversation with your healthcare practitioner. And then we have the exercise handout, uh, the Two Fit to Fracture, which is a, an amazing resource that we have based kind of all of our exercise um, uh, information and research on. So those can be accessed on our, on our website as well uh, so that you can have it in writing because I know sometimes this is a lot of information when somebody's just talking at you. 
Um, I know for myself, I like to have, I like to be able to see things as well. So going onto our website, looking um, for the resources and it's all there for you. Okay, great. And there was another, there was a question about medication. Um, mm -hmm. and, and again, you may want to address this. Um, can I switch medications? For example, I'm on one medication and I was wondering if I could switch to the new one that you talked about. Oh, okay. So what I've always suggested for people, one is um, have that conversation with your healthcare provider. If the medication is working for you and there's really no reason to switch, you know, I sometimes question why, why kind of switch if, if it's working for you. Um, but I hope what this does is to know that there's a new medication out there and to kind of look on the website, research it a little bit so that you have, you can go to your healthcare professional or your doctor and really have an educated discussion on what that medication is and why, why you might want to switch medications. Because sometimes a doctor just to switch, they're going to want to know why. Um, are you having some side effects? Is it, is it doing something? So writing those things down, um, it's a good suggestion too. So writing down, you know, are you having a side effect to it? Is is it not working the way you want it to work? Is it is it difficult to take? Is it difficult to swallow? Um, so those are some of the conversations you could have with your doctor to then maybe look at a, a different medication that might be easier for you to take, or you might be more compliant taking it because if I only need to do an injection twice a year, I'll remember that as opposed to having to try and take something once a week or once a month. But I think really educating yourself on the different medications that are out there and then looking at yourself and saying, why do I need to change it? And, and writing those things down so that when you have the, the discussion, you actually remember when you're sitting in front of the doctor or talking to them on the phone. So I hope that's helpful. Yes, that's great. Thank you, Kathy. So I think I would just like to remind everyone now that um, we have gone through most of the questions, but we do have some questions that we aren't able to get to. And we also had questions last week from part one. So we'll be going through all of those questions together. Um, and then we'll, we'll get back to everyone um, with the answers to their questions. We appreciate um, all of the questions that you've had on both parts, part one and part two. So on behalf of Osteoporosis Canada, I wanted to really thank Kathy um, for presenting our Speaking of Bones in part one last week and part two today. I think that um, she gave some great um, information that um, you'll be able to use and, and supplement the other um, webinars that some people may have been able to join, as well as our handouts that have been attached. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that there will be an evaluation survey which will come to you after this presentation in an email. Um, we appreciate everyone um, answering that survey and providing us feedback on the uh, presentation. We did receive um, some surveys from part one, which is um, really very helpful in us planning and moving ahead. And I also wanted to, um, Kathy already did this, but just to remind people to check our website, which will include updates and new virtual presentations that we will be having and the ones that are up there that we've done uh, for example, last week, there is one coming up this week on Thursday, April 30th, and that is called Cooking with Pantry Staples During COVID-19. And this will be with a professional home economist, Emily Richards, and that takes place at 2.30 um, Eastern Time. So again, thank you so much, Kathy, and thank you everyone who um, joined us today on this webinar. Um, we really appreciate you joining us. Be well and keep safe. Thank you very much.